Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer, and this is Superhouse. One thing that many people ask me about is the overall structure of my home automation system. How do all the different pieces fit together? I often refer to things like MQTT and OpenHAB and other technologies, but without any real explanation of how they link to each other. What I'm going to do in this episode is just run you through, at a very high level, all of the different things that I use in my home automation system. I'm not going to show you everything, and I'm not going to dive deep into anything in particular. I'm just going to show you the different pieces, the building blocks, or the pieces of the puzzle that come together to make the overall picture. That way you can then see how it all fits together. And when I talk about something in particular, like a sensor that might publish to MQTT, you'll know what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview, we'll look around the house, and I'll show you some of the things I use. Most home automation tours do things totally backwards. They start with showing you something like a light and then you know, controlling it from your phone, which is cool, but it doesn't really explain how anything works. What I'm going to do today is take you through more of a signal path approach. I'm going to show you how power comes into the property, how it gets into the house, and then we'll follow the path through to how it goes through the control system and eventually ends up back out on lights or whatever it is that you're wanting to control around the house. Now my house has a switchboard out the front. Pretty much all houses do because there needs to be somewhere to have the electricity meter so the power company can come along and read it. There needs to be some form of external master circuit breaker for safety reasons. Now it's fairly common in uh, separate dwellings like this to only have one switchboard. In fact, before the renovations, this was the entire switchboard for our house. Power came in from the street, came to this switchboard, there are a number of circuit breakers, the power meter was sitting next to this, and from here it's distributed out to the various power points, the light switches and everything else around the house. That's all there is to it. There's nothing else there. But in multi-tenant dwellings, things like apartments or anywhere that you need to have separated control, it's fairly common to have a sub-switch board. So what happens then is power comes into the front of the property and then it's distributed to a separate switchboard that might be inside each apartment or each dwelling. And in larger houses and also with home automation systems, that's very common as well. The reason is that if you're going to be controlling a whole lot of things around your house and you want to have a control system inside your switchboard, you don't want that sitting out accessible from the street. You've got a whole lot of expensive home automation gear there that you don't want people messing with. So typically what happens is the power comes in from the street, goes to your primary switchboard, and is then distributed to a subboard somewhere else in the house, somewhere that is secure and random members of the public can't walk up to. And it's going to be a lot bigger than a standard switchboard because it will have all of the control system in it. And that is where all the home automation system lives. So in my particular case, we have power coming in underground, going to the main switchboard. From there, it's distributed to two subboards. Now to minimize wiring runs, because everything has to be cabled back to it, we decided to put one subboard on the west end of the house and one subboard at the east end of the house. That way we can distribute power to those two locations and then from there distribute out to the rest of the house. So where I'm standing right now is that front switchboard. This is the primary one where power comes in from the street. Looking at our diagram, it's this red square right here. Power comes in and from here it's distributed to a couple of direct power circuits, things like the oven which isn't run through the home automation system, it just gets direct power. And then from there it's distributed to the other two sub switchboards. Let's check those out. Now this is the smaller of the two sub boards, so this is at the east end of the house. Looking at our little diagram, it's right about here. This is the switchboard itself. Ignore all of that interesting looking stuff up there for now, we'll come back to that. That's part of the home automation system as well. But for now we're just looking at how power gets to the lights. So if we have a look inside here, at first it just looks like a normal switchboard. It's got a couple of circuit breakers on there and that's about it. All of the interesting stuff is inside. If you look at the whole switchboard, it's probably pretty confusing. It just looks like a whole bunch of wires. Let's narrow it down and go through it step by step. Just over here is where the main power inlet comes in. This is the big cable that comes from the other distribution switchboard that I just showed you out at the front of the house. 
So this is where the main power comes in from the street through that distribution switchboard and ends up down at this one. There are three cables that come in from here. First is earth. That comes across to this bus bar, which is across on the right. That provides a whole lot of convenient places that you can screw earth connections in. There's also neutral, which runs up to this other bus bar up in the top left. From there it runs down to one side of the earth leakage circuit breaker, which is sitting just down here on a DIN rail. There's also active. That goes to one side of a master circuit breaker. This circuit breaker basically controls all the power through this sub switch board. So from there on the other side of that circuit breaker, it also runs down through to this earth leakage circuit breaker. So if you put those three things together, we've got the main inlet coming through, we've got earth, neutral and active. So then just beside that, we have some regular circuit breakers. This is exactly what you would see inside a normal switchboard. Nothing that I've shown you so far in here is specific to home automation. In fact, if you look at this section in the middle, that's exactly what you would see on a typical, you know, small suburban switchboard. That's pretty much the same as what was in the original switchboard for the whole house. It might have a couple more circuit breakers than that, but that's basically it. The interesting thing happens with the connections coming out of the circuit breaker. So normally what happens is that from these circuit breakers, power goes out to things like your light switches and from the light switch, it goes to the light itself. So the switch that's on the wall directly controls the power that's going to the light. But in my house, because it's been totally rewired for this home automation system, it doesn't. The power stays within the switchboard here and it goes up to these banks of DIN rail relays. The output from those three circuit breakers goes up and supplies power to the relays and the relays themselves can then control power going out to the rest of the house. Each one of those goes to a different load in the house, like a light or one of the blinds, and they can control whether the power goes to it or not. That way there is central control over each of the lights, and each of the devices in the house, instead of having them controlled through switches located on the wall. Each of these relays is double pole, double throw, which means that it can make um, connections on two different circuits at the same time. So what I've done is had the electrician loop around the active and neutral to the, um, the common connection on each of those relays, you can see that um, it's got multiple connections to the top of each relay uh, little mount there. And then the output, which is the normally open uh, contact on both sides for the active and neutral, goes back out to the load in the house, the light or whatever it is that it needs to turn on. These relays have 12 volt coils. So the screw terminals that you see along the bottom row there are the 12 volt inputs that fire the relays. They come from a little control box, which is down near the bottom of the switchboard. Right now, this is about the weakest part of the whole home automation system. You can see that it's a bit of a temporary job. The cable from the controller, which is basically a Freetronics Ether Mega with some Relay 8 shields on it, goes on these cables up to the relays. That way the Arduino can control the relays and turn them on or off. It's got Ethernet built in, so it also has a connection through here to a network socket. Effectively, this gives the switchboard an Ethernet connection and it allows all of the outputs inside the switchboard to be controlled over the network. So when I first took the cover off this switchboard, you probably looked at this and thought it was all just a big mess. But now you can see that it actually makes sense. We've got the input feed, goes through some circuit breakers which go up to those relays. The relays go out to different devices around the house. There's a controller which turns the relays on or off. Effectively, it's a switchboard with an Ethernet interface that allows it to be controlled. Now if we look over on the right hand side, there is a bit of 19 inch rack. I've mounted it vertically with the rack rails horizontal, just because that was the only way I could fit it into this space. It has a patch panel which has connections to ethernet connections all around the house, including the one from the switchboard. So one of these ports is actually the switchboard. It also has an ethernet switch, simple enough. In between them is this power over ethernet injector. So if you combine these three one unit uh, devices, this is basically the networking for this part of the house. We have the patch connections to the end points, we have the ethernet switch, and we can inject power into the network. Just beside that is another mysterious looking device. This is for connection to the light switches. I'm not gonna talk about that in detail right now. 
I've got an entire episode which I've actually finished filming already which will be uploaded after this one which explains exactly how I built this and it's a very important part of the system so it really warrants a lot of detail. And just down the bottom here we have this funny looking box. This is the LIN bus breakout. I did an entire episode about this previously. This is what controls the electric motors in the conservatory to open and close the windows. It really needs to be put into a nice rack mount case and put up the top. Or I need to do something else with it to make it a bit more neat. It's not nice having it just hanging out the bottom here. Now that's the simpler one of the two home automation switchboards. Let's go and have a look at the other one. It's got a whole lot more stuff in it. The system at this end of the house is a lot bigger. There was a lot more space to work with. So what we did was locate most of the home automation gear down this end instead of in the switchboard at the other end that I showed you a moment ago. The basic layout is the same. It's got the main switchboard which is used to control power to different devices. It's got a little bit of a rack which has got ethernet switch, patch panel and um, power over ethernet injector, that sort of stuff. Same as at the other end. Let's have a look inside the switchboard and you'll see that it's very similar. It's got a few circuit breakers on there just like the other one. If we open it up, you can see it's got circuit breakers, DIN rail mounted relays, and in this particular case, the controller for the relays is external. It's not mounted inside the metal cabinet itself. Now, this controller is obviously a temporary system. We're going to get to that in a future episode. I'm going to go through a lot of detail about how I'm going to solve that problem. But it's basically an Arduino compatible board. It's a Freetronix Ethermega. It's got some um, relay drivers there, which are just wired through to the DIN rail mounted relays and that way this switchboard also has an ethernet connection it's just that instead of being physically mounted inside it it's mounted outside that's basically because I ran out of space there's so much more stuff in this switchboard than in the one at the other end down in the bottom of the cabinet we have this little rack as you can see it's got a couple of patch panels a couple of ethernet switches it's right down the bottom with all of those yellow cables it's got that button controller that I mentioned uh, once again, that's in a future episode. In fact, it's going to be the very next one to be uploaded straight after this one. Otherwise, it's basically just networking for the house. Just above that little rack, you can see some miscellaneous things. There are some uh, little power supplies, plug backs. Up in the top right, there is the black uh, hard disk. So it's a couple of disks in a little array, which is used for um, backup purposes for all of the Apple um, devices on the network. That's connected to the uh, Airport Extreme wireless base station on the right hand side. On the top left there you can see a couple of little boxes that say Super House. That is, those are basically the brain of the house. And there are two of them. It really only needs one, but I've got two running at the moment. One is running um, the previous release of OpenHab and the other is running the new release. I'm experimenting with migrating from one to the other, so I've got both of them running at the same time. That little box is really the core of the system and we're going to look at that in more detail in a moment. And up towards the top is the switchboard. Now that you've seen how the other one was laid out, you can see the order is a little bit different with this. It's got the relays at the bottom and circuit breakers at the top. But if you understood the um, diagram for that previous one and what I'd talked through with that, then this should make a whole lot of sense. A whole lot of relays, driving loads at this end of the house and um, circuit breakers for those circuits. Those two little white boxes I just showed you are what I call a building brain. It's just my nickname for this sort of thing. And there's nothing really special about it, but this is the hardware that the primary software runs on for controlling my house. So I'll show you what's inside the box. Now you don't actually need any special hardware to do this. I just made this for my own purposes. So inside there is just a Raspberry Pi. In this particular case it's a Pi Zero with Wi-Fi. Um, but Normally I use a full-size Pi on this, and I've designed it just to fit into this standard case with uh, little slots in here where circuit boards go in. So I included a, um, a rounded bit on the end so I can get my finger in. So to get the circuit board out, I can just spread it and pop it out like that. So there's a carrier circuit board, and what that includes is the little switch mode power supply, there's a radio transmitter and receiver. These are 433 MHz um, transmitter and receiver. There's an AT Mega 328 and the crystal. So this is basically like an Arduino Uno on a board with built-in um, transmission and um, reception and a built-in switch mode power supply. It's got an FTDI header on there just for loading up um, the sketch. 
and um, got power LED. There's a receive activity, transmit activity, DC jack. The reason I included this little switch mode regulator module was I wanted to be able to just plug in you know, any random uh, plug pack like 9 volt, 12 volt, whatever, doesn't matter. Just plug it in, you know it's going to work. And um, communications happen through here. There are a couple of level shifters here. So there's a serial connection between the Raspberry Pi and this main carrier board. Now the thing is that you don't actually even need any of this. You could just use a Raspberry Pi or an old PC, any old computer, like a laptop that you got lying around. You could use that to run all of the software that I'm about to show you. The only reason that I have all of this is to make a little self-contained unit with the onboard power regulation and uh, ability to do um, both transmission and reception of signals for controlling uh, wireless devices. So now it's time to talk about software. That can be pretty hard on a video because I can't really show you very much. It's a whole, whole lot of hand waving and I'll try to draw some diagrams. Hopefully you'll get the gist of it. Now the core of the system that I use and something that's really, really important in a lot of home automation systems now and industrial automation is MQTT. Now MQTT is a bit of glue what it allows you to do is take a whole lot of different software systems that don't normally talk to each other and let them communicate in a really common way. So um, back when I was studying, I stayed in a share house. And um, you know, back in those days, we didn't have mobile phones. So what we had was a whiteboard in the kitchen. And um, so whenever we'd make a phone call from their share house phone, we'd make a mark on the whiteboard and that way, when the bill came in, you could see, oh yeah, John has made 27 calls and uh, Jack has made 17 calls. And then you can work out what the proportion of the bill is. So think of MQTT this way. Imagine you've got a whiteboard. And yes, I know, I'm drawing a picture of a whiteboard on a whiteboard. That's just the way it is. So in our particular case, we had a section for the phone. And in phone, we had a section for John, say another section for Jack. And then what would happen is that each time I made a phone call from the house phone, I'd make a mark on here. Each time Jack did, make a mark there. So eventually over time, you would end up with a record of all of the, um, the phone calls that had been made. So we've got the section of phone and then we've got subsections for the different people inside the house. So there might be other things that you use it for. Imagine that you have a standing arrangement that every Friday you're going to order a bunch of pizza. So you have another section which is pizza and you might have a section once again for John, a section for Jack and in there what you do is you say John likes meat lovers, and you make a mark in there to say whether you're going to be around that particular Friday to have pizza. Then what happens is when Friday comes along, whoever is ordering the pizza can have a look and say, yeah, that person's going to be home. This person's not going to be home. They'll put in a pizza order. It all comes in. Everybody's happy. So the whiteboard itself becomes a central place to share messages. And it can be done in a fairly structured way, like keeping a tally of phone calls like this. There are defined places to put these different bits of information. MQTT is essentially that for software. Now, if you're familiar with databases, you can think of MQTT as being a bit like a network enabled key value store. It's a non-relational database. It's basically a place to have a whole lot of buckets where you can put information and then you can request what the value or the contents of that bucket is. And it's got notifications built in so that when the value of a particular key is updated, anybody that wants to know about that value is told about it. Now, if you don't know about databases, that might not have made a lot of sense to you. So think about it this way. Here we have the computer, which is running the software. So this is the actual hardware or a virtual machine or whatever you might have. In my particular case, it's that Raspberry Pi in the little box. So it's the brain. So I'm going to say this is the brain of my system and that's the hardware. Now running inside that is a piece of software. And in my case, 
I use Mosquito, which is an MQTT broker. You can think of the broker as being like the server or the database. This is what acts as a central coordination point for all of the different things that might want to communicate through this system. In other words, this is like the whiteboard for your devices in your home automation system. Inside that, there are a whole lot of buckets where information can be stored. And you can assign arbitrary names to these. Those names are called topics. So in the case of um, the information about the phone calls that I was talking about earlier, what we could do is have a hierarchical topic system. So we could have a topic that is called phone calls. And then underneath that topic, we could have a subtopic for John. And we also have phone calls and then a subtopic for Jack. And then that has a value. So what happens is that if I make a phone call and I want to make a record of it, then I publish. So I might have something else out here and this might be me. So I publish into this box and I set a value. So I've made 27 phone calls. And over here we have Jack who publishes and Jack might be up to 17 phone calls. And what this means is that there is a central place where that information can be stored. And any uh, other device or piece of software that can communicate with this MQTT broker can look at the value of that particular topic and see what it is. But they also get notifications. So this is publishing. You can also have subscriptions. So that's how you get the information back out of it. Say we have another thing down here, which is going to subscribe to both of those. I don't know if you can see this green very well. And I've got to say, drawing on a whiteboard as a way to describe software really sucks. There's got to be a better way to do this, but oh well. So what happens is that we have something down here Maybe this is a person who has been assigned to um, divvy up the bill. And I will just call them Bob. I'll use black so that you can see it. And what they need to know is whenever a, uh, an event has been updated in here, they need to be notified of it. So when I publish into this particular topic, Bob is subscribed to that topic. So Bob gets the update and reads the value 27 because that's the value that's been put into it. So what you have is a way of having a central scratch pad or whiteboard that can be used for transferring messages around the place. Now, you might still be thinking, what's the point of this? It doesn't really seem all that useful, but this is really the enabler. This is the key that allows a whole lot of different home automation devices or any devices really to talk to each other without needing to know anything about each other. Now, I've been talking about these as if they're people and we're talking about the share house situation, but this could be anything. For example, this could be a temperature sensor which periodically publishes the current temperature reading. Maybe it does it every 60 seconds. It's published 27 degrees as the temperature. This could be uh, temperature slash lounge room. And so 27 degrees in the lounge room, it's a hot day. And then you might have some other system down here, perhaps the climate control system, which is subscribed to the temperature in the lounge room because it needs to make decisions about whether to turn the cooling on or off. Whenever this is updated, perhaps the temperature goes up. It now hits 28 degrees. The system down here, which is subscribed to it, immediately gets that change and it can make a decision. It can say, 28 degrees, I've now exceeded my set point. I'm going to turn on the air conditioning but it doesn't need to know where that information came from. All it needs to know is how to talk to the MQTT broker to get that data. So what that means is that you can have different devices. This could be an Arduino based device. It could be a data feed from your Bureau of Meteorology. It really doesn't matter. As long as the data gets into this system, 
And the way the publication and the subscription works is using a very well-defined protocol and it can be connected over different methods. So this could be over TCP IP, it could be a serial connection, it could be um, a connection from another piece of software just running on the same physical machine. It doesn't matter. You've got this universal scratch pad that allows you to pass information around and it does it with quite low latency. So as soon as this information is published, this 27 value, anything subscribed to it will know, well, depending on the particular load on your machine and your network connectivity and all those sorts of things, but it should know within milliseconds. So you could have a very high speed stream of data. I'm talking about slowly changing data here, like a temperature sensor that publishes every 60 seconds, but you could have something that's publishing many, many times a second. You could, have, you could build quite big infrastructures using this and then have uh, all sorts of messages passing through it. So a lot of instant messenger systems actually use MQTT as their backend messaging system, I like guess the way of passing messages. Because these things could be an app running on a phone which connects to the MQTT broker. Or it could be a physical device like an Arduino which is reading values and uh, from sensors and then publishing them. Or it could be a device that is subscribed, reading values, and then making decisions based on what that is. So the MQTT structure really forms the glue that lets you take a whole lot of different devices that don't necessarily need to know anything about each other and stick them together so that they can interoperate. Now to give you a practical demonstration of what I'm talking about, here are four shells that are logged into the building brain. That little Raspberry Pi with the Mosquito MQTT broker on it. Down on the bottom two shells, what I'm going to do is subscribe to a couple of topics. You can see the Mosquito sub uh, command is just a little helper program that you can use to subscribe to a topic. And you can see that I've specified the topic is office slash temperature. And over in this shell, I'm going to subscribe to office slash humidity. Now up here, what I can do is publish to those topics. So I could publish to office temperature and I'll give it the message of 12. And down in the bottom, you can see that the message of 12 came through on the client that is subscribed to that particular topic. If I publish a different message, then that comes through as well. And you can see that it's pretty much instant. We're on the local machine here. It's just publishing and subscribing um, directly within the box. So, you know, fractions of a millisecond should be the response time on it. And we could push quite large volumes of data through. Now, I'm going to publish to the humidity topic. And you should see that the message comes through on the bottom right. So we have two clients there that are subscribed to different topics. What we can also do is use wildcards because the topics are hierarchical, in this case I'm going to subscribe to office slash hash. And hash in MQTC is a wildcard. So now if I publish to the humidity topic, you'll see that the client in the bottom right, which is subscribed to that topic, has seen it. And also the client in the top right, which is wildcarded, has seen it. Now if I publish to temperature, and this time I'll make the message some text random stuff. Once again, you can see it's been picked up in the top right and in the bottom left. So these different uh, terminals don't know anything about each other. One of them is publishing, the others have subscribed. Now I have a little Arduino with a temperature and humidity sensor connected to it, and that's going to publish to those same two topics. I've just plugged it in now, and if you look at the, uh, the subscribe topics in a moment, once it starts up, well, you can see now it's just published 21.7 in office temperature in the bottom left and 46.1 in office humidity on the bottom right. You can also see that the wildcarded client there is picking up both readings. Now I started by publishing to these topics using the command line client, but now those same topics are having messages published to them by a totally different client. In this case, it's a little hardware device which is sitting off connected to my Wi-Fi and publishing values from the sensor that's connected to it. So let's look at a few very specific examples of how I use MQTT as glue to pull all of this together. So we have the brain, the little Raspberry Pi, 
running the MQTT broker, which is Mosquito. Now we also have the switchboard that we were looking at earlier. The switchboard has in it those DIN rail mounted relays, and those relays are wired through to different lights around the house. That way I can turn them on or off by applying power to those relays. It also has the Arduino based controller in it, and that's what is connected to the Ethernet network. When we were looking at those switchboards earlier, there was the Ethernet connection. And that means that this device is connected to the same network as the Raspberry Pi. Now the way I use that is the controller subscribes to a topic within the, uh, the MQTT broker. So we have a topic here and it's watching for messages that might appear in it. Now that particular topic might be say switchboard east or switchboard west and anything that is published to this particular topic will be seen by the switchboard. That means we can send commands to the switchboard simply by publishing to MQTT. We don't need to know anything about how this works. All we have to know is the address of the broker to connect to and the topic to publish to. All right, so that's part of the puzzle. But what actually publishes to that topic? What is it that sends the commands that allows the switchboard to turn on and off? Well, it could be all sorts of things. There is another very important thing that I haven't shown you yet. You saw it in the switchboard, but I haven't explained how it works. And that is my light switch controller. So around the house, I have light switches. They might be one gang, two gang, three gang, four gang, doesn't matter. Those are all connected to the light switch controller. And once again, it's an Arduino based device. So it's got an Ether Mega in it and it reads when these buttons are pressed. Now that in turn publishes. So it's a pub into a topic and the topic might be just buttons or light switches, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. So when a button on the wall is pressed, the light controller detects that and it publishes back to MQTT. And so we now have incoming commands and we have outgoing commands, but they're in isolation. They're in different topics. This is publishing uh, the command that goes out. And this is where the events from the light switches come in but we need some way to glue them together. It's still just a scratch pad that's publishing information. Now I deliberately haven't shown you much about the lighting controller yet. I've shown you how the switchboard works, but I've got an entire episode dedicated to the lighting controller and that's gonna be uploaded right after this one. So if you wanna know more about how that works, you'll have plenty of information about how to build your own. For now, all you need to know is that when a button is pressed on the wall, a publication event happens to MQTT so that something here, whatever is subscribed to that topic, knows that someone has activated that light switch. So next we need something that is going to link these together. There needs to be some glue in the middle. Now when I started this, what I was doing was using little scripts that I'd written that were just running directly on the box. So what I had down here was a little script that was actually written in PHP and I've got a version written in Perl. And what that would do is it would subscribe to certain topics and publish to certain topics. And it was basically a rule engine. So it would say, if this particular light switch with this ID is pressed, it knows that the, um, you need to turn that particular light on or off. Of course, you also need to keep track of state. So you need to know if it's currently on and if it is, turn it off. And if it's currently off, turn it on whenever someone activates one of these switches. So the rule engine keeps track of the state of all of the different devices in the system and it knows how to bind them together. So by defining linkages between the inputs and the outputs, you can then have all sorts of different things happen. Now this is where you have a lot of flexibility in the system because now the control over the outputs is disconnected from the inputs except through software. That means that you can simply reconfigure your software to totally change the behavior. If you want to 
change one of these light switches and make it do something different, there is no physical connection between this and the lights that it might be controlling. All you have to do is update your rules. You could say, oh, that button on the wall, I don't want it to do the exhaust fan in the kitchen anymore. I want it to do the underbench lighting. Change a couple of entries in your configuration here, and now the light switch does something totally different. Now, just to show you what I mean about flexibility, I'm going to change this um, light switch in the kitchen, and I'm gonna do it right now with no edits, no cuts, so you can see the result. Right now, I have this two-way switch, and if I press the top one, it controls the lights. Turn it back on again. Now, the second button controls the electric blind, which you can just see over my shoulder there. So when these buttons are pressed, the button controller is seeing an event. So it's seeing a button press event on button one or on button two. It's then publishing to MQTT. And then the rules engine is saying that particular button is associated with the blind or with the lights or whatever. Now we recently had some exterior lighting installed. If you look outside, just about there somewhere, out on the veranda, there is a lamp. And there are a series of these lamps on the posts around the veranda. So when the electrician came around, he installed those and ran the cabling all the way back to the switchboard. One of those little relays that you saw earlier is to control power to those lights. Now I can control those lights using my phone because I can send a command using OpenHAB that is going to turn on that particular output. But I don't have a physical light switch on the wall that allows me to control it. So what I'm going to do is pull off this switch so I'll just pop the cover off, unscrew it. So as you can see there, it's got the two-way switch on it. Now this particular switch is not controlling the power directly. As I said, it's just a logical input. It's using ethernet cable with an RJ45 connector. So I've unplugged it. And over here, I've got a three-way switch, which is the same thing. It's just that instead of having input one and input two, it's also got input three. So as you can see, it's currently powered down. I'll plug it into the cable. The light will come on. So now we have three inputs. And if I press the top one, it's still button one. So it still controls the lights as before. Button two still controls the blind. And prior to doing this, I've already updated the rules engine. So it now knows that button three is to be associated with the lights outside. So if I press button three, you can see that the lamp that's outside there came on. So we now have a switch in the kitchen, which can be used to control those lights. So I can now put that back on the wall and away we go. Now the skeptical among you will be saying, well, so what? Like changing a light switch is a very rare event. You gain a little bit of flexibility, but not, you know, anything that's really exciting. So why would you bother? Well, the interesting thing is that now that we have this software linkage, we can introduce a whole lot more intelligence into the system. Now, I was using this little homegrown rules engine for a while. Uh, if I was doing this now, I would use a piece of software called Node Red. So, uh, what you really should do is go and check out Node Red if you're interested in this. Right now I'm not using it. I've still got my original homegrown piece of code doing that. But that's because I started doing this before, like long before Node Red existed. So I'm not even going to bother publishing my code for that. There's no point. Node Red is far more sophisticated. If you're wanting to set up um, rules based around MQTT, go for Node Red. But even with this little rules engine in place, that's still just the start. What I have hanging off the side here is another piece of software called OpenHAB. And there are a variety of options for the code that you can be running here. Um, I've been using OpenHAB for a while. I'm currently still on the 1.x release series and I've got that second little brain running the two release series, but that's not live yet on my house. My house is still running on the 1.x release. And OpenHAB is essentially like a rules engine on steroids. What it does is keep track of a whole lot of things within the system. So it keeps track of the current state. It knows whether things are on or off so that it can toggle the results. It has rules built in. Um, it has scheduling built in. 
So what you can do is define a whole lot of different circumstances under which you want things to happen. So for example, you can have OpenHab subscribe to a topic. Say we've got a topic which is luminance and it's how bright is the light outside. It knows time of day and various other things. So we could have a rule in here that says um, subscribe to the luminance topic and if luminance is less than 50% and the time of day is from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. then publish to this topic and turn on the outside lights. So with a couple of lines of code we can now make a system that will turn on the lights at dusk and then turn them off again at 11 p.m. So it then gives you the flexibility to start thinking about how do we make this system behave. And as you get more and more inputs and more and more sources of data, you can make more and more decisions. For example, OpenHab has plugins for a whole lot of different services. One of them is the network health service, which allows it to detect whether a certain device is on the network. Now, one way you can use that is to detect whether people are home. If the OpenHab system can detect that your mobile phone is currently on your Wi-Fi network, it knows that you're home. So you could have it so that the exterior lighting is only turned on if you are not home. Uh, it assumes that if you're home then you don't need it on or you'll turn it on yourself manually. But if you're not home and these conditions are met, you're probably going to be coming home so it turns the exterior lighting on. And then you can have all sorts of other factors come into play as well. What you'll find is that it starts off very simple, just with some controls, some inputs, but then as you start taking all of these different things and gluing them together, you can do far more complex things. Another good example is that we can define a button. Say, in fact, you could have one of these buttons on the wall here. It's just like a light switch on the wall. That might be your leaving home button. And that could be one near your front door. So you press that button publication happens to the MQTT broker and then your rules engine, whatever it happens to be, might say, oh, this person has just pressed the leaving home button. So that means I need to do a whole series of events. I've got to turn off all of the lights in the house except for the front light. If it's dark outside, I'll leave that on for a while and then turn it off 10 minutes later. I need to close all the curtains in the house, close all the windows and lock all the doors. Also change the settings on the climate control to save energy, maybe do a few other things as well. So you can have one button, which is like central locking for your house, but more than just the locks. It does a whole lot of different things. So if we look at an actual physical button on the wall, I've got one just down here. This button panel here is connected through to the controller, which is mounted in that little rack. So when I press this button, what actually happens is that that button press was detected by the button controller. It then published to MQTT so that, um, and after that, of course, it doesn't care. It's done its job. It's just published. That publication was then seen by OpenHab, which knows that that means I need to change the state or toggle the state of the lights in the office. And it then published to the broker again, to the switchboard command topic and said, turn off this channel and then the lights turn off. So if I press that again, it'll know that once again it needs to toggle the state and then the lights turn back on. But because there is that software link and OpenHab is the one that's doing the work, the actual source of that command could come from all sorts of different places. As I said, it could be based on rules, it could be button presses. It could also be coming from the OpenHab app, which is connected through to here. So on my phone, for example, I'm running the OpenHab app. I can go into the office garage section and say office light, click the button, it turns the light off. So that command that I just sent from here came into OpenHab, which then published to MQTT, switchboard turned off. So now I can control the lights either from my phone or by pressing the button on the wall. And the state, because the state is being tracked through OpenHab, it knows that it updates. So right now, don't know if we can focus on here, the app at the top is showing that the it's the little green slider. It's showing that the lights are currently in an on state. So I'll reach back here and press the button. 
and the state on the app updates to show that it's off. And I'll press the button again, state on the app updates to show the lights are on. So it's all linked together. The events coming through here are updating the state within OpenHAB, so it keeps track of what's going on around the house. Now this has barely scratched the surface of what I've got in my home automation system. I've only shown you a couple of things, just the core of the system and how the lights are controlled and button inputs from the wall. But there's a whole lot more to it, lots of sensors and other devices. But this video is long enough already. And now that you know the basic framework, as I do more episodes, you'll be able to understand how they fit together. When I show you something like a sensor that publishes to MQTT, you know what that means. So finally, I want to say a big thank you to all my Patreon sponsors, uh, Patreon supporters. And what I'm going to try to do in future episodes, starting right now, is give away something to a random Patreon supporter in each episode. Now, for this particular episode, it's just about the architecture of the system. There isn't a particular thing that's in it. So I figured what I would do is I'm going to give away one of my building brains. It's got the Arduino, oh sorry, yeah, the Arduino derived um, daughter board that I designed. It's got the 433 megahertz transmitter and receiver in it, little switch mode regulator. It's got the Raspberry Pi Zero W in this particular case, and I'll include a micro SD card with, the, um, with all the software on it that I'm running. So what I did was have a look at my list of Patreon supporters, and I randomly picked one, and there was a supporter, um, the only name on the supporter profile is Rizlar, someone in the UK. So I'm gonna contact them by email, get some shipping information, and send this building brain to them. So for future episodes, I, depending on the episode, I might do more giveaways. And um, if you wanna be in the running, please go and support me on Patreon and that'll help me do more of these videos. Thank you very much. See you next time.